In our last video, we looked at the vision of the world that works for all and its four different aspects. 100% renewable, 100% non-toxic, ecologically abundant, and equitable. To understand how close we are to this vision, we need to look at what's working and what's not working, and look at the trends in all these different areas. The renewable goal is ultimately about having needed resources in perpetuity from which to draw on to maintain life. The basic logic is that if you're using resources and wish to do so in the future, you need to make sure that what you take gets replenished. That is true whether we're looking at the carbon cycle and the different forms of carbon that we use. It also means looking at our more non-renewable resources. So metals, plastics, other forms of fossil fuel, which are also carbon-based. If we already use non-renewables like metals, fossil fuels, and fossil fuel derivatives like plastics, we need to recycle and replenish them. After we use fossil fuels, the carbon is in the form of CO2, and more difficult to recapture than solid metals and plastics. In theory, if we recapture the CO2 and turn it back into fossil fuel, we can keep using it. However, that pathway is fraught with difficulty in terms of the thermodynamics around how to convert CO2 back into usable carbon, as well as the vast quantities of carbon because we use so much energy. Carbon needs to be brought down back out of the atmosphere to be used again, whether that's turning it back into fuel, whether that's recapturing it in soil, or other ways that humans use carbon. Precisely why there is such a focus on renewable energy and most renewable energy doesn't involve burning mass, so there's no mass to recapture and restore. We are simply harvesting solar energy in its different forms. Renewable energy is effectively unlimited, powered by the sun. Good trends can be found in eliminating toxics from air in some places. NASA has documented lower nitrogen dioxide in the air over the past decade, despite the increase in population and increase in number of cars on the road. Unfortunately, rapid growing countries cannot say the same. The World Health Organization has found that air pollution is now the largest single environmental health risk. And a staggering 92% of people live in places where the air is unhealthy. As for the solution, the key to protecting people is to produce less air pollution. We need to consume less, promote cleaner technologies, regulate sources of pollution, and redesign our cities. Nitrogen and phosphorus are nutrients which we and other organisms need, like really need, in order to grow and respire and exist. But when we go and make like ludicrous amounts of these nutrients available, ecosystems get very confused. So when wastewater from our houses or runoff from farms washes those compounds into rivers and streams, it can cause huge algal blooms that choke out the rest of the plants and animals in the stream. Phosphate and nitrate pollution causes dead zones. The biggest example of this happening right this very minute is in the Gulf of Mexico at the mouth of the Mississippi River. Thank you, Hank, from Crash Course. Indeed, the dead zone is an indication of water health for our nation. As of 2012, the EPA reported that more than half of rivers and streams, two-thirds of lakes and ponds, 80% of bays, and 90% of coastal shorelines are impaired by water quality standards. It is healthy to reject the false divide between people and nature. Humans are part of nature, no matter how much effort we make to divorce ourselves. What that means, though, is that we need to seek balance with the other components of our ecosystem. The fact that we have not drives a large portion of what's not working with ecology. In 2005, the UN Millennium Ecosystem Assessment found that approximately 16% of the ecosystem services examined are being degraded or used unsustainably. Humans make up an estimated 36% of mammal mass on the planet, with livestock making up 60%, leaving only 4% in wild mammals. Having been under 1 billion people for 100,000 years, in the last century we've increased to 7.5 billion humans on the planet. That drives the stresses on ecology that we saw earlier. Even with that increase in population, we have seen some improvement. The World Bank documents that between 1990 and 2015, 
undernourishment dropped, poverty dropped, primary education completion increased, and access to improved sanitation and wastewater treatment increased. Equity also demands a better allocation of wealth among all people. Today we have the top 1% of people owning half of global assets. If we've heard this before, seldom do we think about the flip side of that equation. Only 50% of resources are left to the remaining 99%. Even if we accept some natural differences in living and income, the vast majority should be competing for something much closer to 99%.